Hey everyone, Welcome to the latest installment of the Accessible Technology um, webinar series. Just getting my desktop in order here. And um, I have a, a few slides that I want to use to um, sort of introduce the topic. Um, we are here, of course, to talk about web accessibility. The emphasis today is going to be on tools. Um, and so we're going to demonstrate a, a variety of different web accessibility tools that we use. But I wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of what is this all about. Um, so this may be a review for some of you. Um, but it, it is essential con content. Um, first of all, um, your speakers, myself, Carol Thompson and Anne Marie Golden is um, also here, going to be going to be uh, kind of joining me. We're both part of the IT accessibility team, which is part of UWIT Accessible Technology Services. So we provide all sorts of services, um, consulting, um, developing resources, providing trainings, and so forth to help with IT accessibility issues. So any questions you have related to um, web accessibility or document accessibility or video accessibility or accessibility of software that you're purchasing, those sorts of things, we are happy to help. So web accessibility, what, what is that exactly? And what are we talking about? Who needs access to the web? Um, well, obviously everybody needs access. Um, we're doing a lot via websites these days, um, both academically and administratively. And there are lots of different ways that people access digital information. Um, so the old school model, which is depicted on the slide here, is to use a keyboard or a mouse for input into this system where you're, you're making requests or you're typing. Um, and for output, you get information back through a monitor. So visually, you access um, the, the output from that system. And, and it is kind of an old school model. What we see here is not the way um, uh, most people access information on a regular basis, that we also have people using their iPhones or using their Android devices or using their Microsoft devices. You've got people who are using tablets and all shapes and sizes and platforms of tablets. Um, you've got people who are not accessing the output visually but are listening to content. That includes people listening to content on these mobile devices, but, but historically that has been the domain of people who are not able to see the monitor. So somebody's blind, they're using a screen reader to read the content of the screen um, through a speech synthesizer. Um, also, people may be using voice for input. Um, and that too is something that more and more people are doing with you know, via mobile devices, having more of a hands-free interface. But that too has historically been the domain of people who are physically unable to, to use the keyboard or the mouse. They may be using the, their voice or they may be using other assistive technologies, head pointers and, and a variety of other things. Um, somebody who's blind may also, uh, rather than using speech output, they may be using Braille output, or they may be using Braille input. This is a device, a refreshable Braille device that um, can do both. It's got cords. Um, the, the eight keys that you see across the top allow a person to type in Braille, um, and the row of dots allow a person to, uh, to access the content of the screen in Braille. And so I, I ran out of slide space, otherwise I could go on and on and on with the different ways that people access digital information. And we have a few examples here as well. This is Jennifer. She's using an IntelliKeys keyboard, so a much larger keyboard than a typical keyboard. And she does that because the keys are larger and they are therefore better targets for her. She has a stick in her right hand and she has enough dexterity to grab that stick and to press the keys on the keyboard with it, but she cannot use a mouse. And so a lot of people are physically unable to use a mouse, but they can use the keyboard, perhaps with some assistive technologies to tab through the interface on, on a website and to use other keys as, um, as you know, it makes sense to do so. 
Um, this is Courtney. She's using a refreshable Braille device. We saw um, we saw you know that on the a couple of slides ago. Here's one that's actually in action. And here is Courtney uh, pictured with a friend Conrad, who uses a lot of different assistive technologies, including voice input and various other AT that can be controlled with a sip and puff device um, to to do clicking and double clicking and um, and so forth. So. Uh, he's, he's a power user of lots of different assistive technologies um, and has a, a graduate degree, a, a law degree from uh, University of Washington Law School. And uh, this is Hannah, and she is doing some programming here using Zoom text. So she needs to magnify the content of the screen, make everything a little bit bigger. Um, she is now uh, a developer at um, Facebook, I believe, after graduating from University of Washington. So these are just a few examples. Um, you know, students who have been at the University of Washington who use a variety of assistive technologies, just to kind of you know reinforce that this this is a human issue. Web accessibility is about providing access to to people. Um, so all of us fall somewhere on this continuum of being able to do certain things and not able to do certain things, and we generally fall somewhere in between on the spectrum. So some people are you know, 20 20 vision so you know perfectly able to see some people are not able to see at all some people most everybody else falls somewhere in the middle um scattered all over that continuum same thing is true if we were to plot you know the, the ability of people to hear or walk or read print or write with a pen pencil or communicate verbally or tune out distraction that scatter plot would be all over the place. Um, it's not a binary thing, you know, people with disabilities and without. It is just you know, having either very good abilities, not so good abilities, or somewhere in between on, on lots of different things. It just depends on sort of what um, characteristic you're measuring. So all of that is to say web accessibility really is about diversity. It, it is, um, you know, making sure that everybody can use your website. So creating a website that works for all users and all users are very, very broadly defined. They're using all sorts of different devices, all sorts of different configurations. Um, we want our content to be accessible to all of them. Web accessibility is also about creating a website that complies with web accessibility standards. So there are standards that have been developed to specifically document what it means from a technical standpoint to have an accessible website. So the standards, most web standards are owned by the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. Um, HTML is an example of that. That is their, their you know, hypertext markup language is their specification. Um, also from an accessibility standpoint, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG as well as accessible rich internet applications or ARIA. Um, these, these are all um, guidelines or standards or specifications that the W3C maintains. So WCAG, what, what is that? That actually plays a key role in accessibility for us. That is essentially the standard for web accessibility. It's an international web accessibility standard. It's been around for a long time. The first version was published in 1998. And then every 10 years after that, um, they've released an update. So 2.0 in 2008, 2.1 in 2018. And that is the most current version and is the version that for many reasons we need to comply with. Um, there's state policy that says all state agencies, including higher education institutions, need to make sure their websites are WCAG 2.1. Um, uh, compliant. And they also specify a level, level 2A, and that corresponds with the success criteria that are the deepest level within WCAG. So if you drill all the way down into WCAG, you get at the deepest level success criteria, which is sort of like a checklist of the things that you absolutely need to do in order to have an accessible website. There are 78 of those in WCAG 2.1, so lots of details. And each is identified with a level, level A, level 2A, level 3A, which corresponds with kind of a balance between importance and difficulty. 
So the level A issues are critical for access and they are reasonably easy to implement. Level 2A may be a little bit less critical or a little bit more difficult, but still uh, pretty important and pretty easy. Level 3A are either not so important and are more uh, or are more difficult. So after many years of sorting this out through uh, legal settlements mostly, but also policy that kind of was driven by those legal settlements um, and uh, re resolutions, we ended up with level 2A being defined as the bar. We are expected to meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A. So that's 50 um, success criteria um, that we're talking about. So a few examples, just so you know what we're talking about. Um, at level A, uh, everything on this, um, on this slide actually is level A except for one, um, but having non-text content for um, having uh, text for non-text content. So for example, having alt text on images for people who can't see those images, having very clear info and relationships in the code. So using heading, structure properly, identifying lists and tables properly, using HTML properly to communicate the relationships between all the parts. That really plays a key role in accessibility. It's another level A issue. The one level 2A issue here is color contrast. They have a very specific ratio um, that varies depending on whether it's large text or not. Um, but that, because it's very specific, it is easily measured. You can tell whether um, your uh, color contrast is optimal um, based on the bag standards. Um, and keyboard accessibility, all functionality should be operable um, with the keyboard. You saw Jennifer earlier, who's unable to use a mouse. Um, Conrad, who's unable to use a mouse. If people are unable to use a mouse, they should be able to access everything using the keyboard. And then uh, the last item here, uh, name, role, and value basically means if you have a complex dynamic website that changes based on user behavior, then you need to use ARIA, which is a separate specification that enhances HTML with code that makes those complex interactions accessible. And, and we could do you know, a whole session on, on ARIA and do talk a lot about that when we get into um, you know, deeper um, content. But so that just kind of gives you an idea. Um, to learn more about all this stuff, our website, we've designed it specifically for that purpose. Um, so you know, go to uw.edu slash accessibility, all sorts of things there about accessible technology, not just websites, but documents and videos and online courses and meetings and, and so forth. We also have frequent events where you can um, you know, do a deeper dive or you can get you know one-on-one -on -one interaction with us. Um, lots of different things that we host, um, opportunities for that. So you can access uh, a current list of events that are upcoming through uw.edu slash accessibility slash events. Just add uh, events onto the end of that. Um, you can also use an accessibility checker or other accessibility related tools which is what we're going to talk about today. And for that, there's a, actually a comprehensive annotated list on our website at uw.edu slash accessibility slash tools. So um, a few tools or web accessibility checkers listed here. The first is your keyboard. Just try accessing your website without using your keyboard. Um, take the no mouse challenge. Um, and, and see you know, if, you can, if you can access everything that you could use with a mouse. Also, I've um, listed several tools here, Wave, Accessibility Bookmarklets, Web Developer Extension, Lighthouse, which is built into Chrome DevTools, and Axe uh, from DQ and Accessibility Consultancy, which is also available in, in Chrome. All these are available in Chrome, uh, also most in Firefox. Um, and SiteImprove. SiteImprove is a tool that we have a, a license for here at the University of Washington. And uh, Anna Marie is actually going to do a SiteImprove demo. So um, I've got just a couple more slides before we get to that, but just, just wanted to put accessibility checkers in perspective that we are going to be looking at these tools and giving you a sense for what they can, uh, what sort of insights they can provide to us. But um, most accessibility problems can't be automatically detected. 
So they're, these are really great and I encourage you to use them. And I encourage you to try to, to remove all errors using these tools. If you can get to zero errors or 100% score, depending on how uh, accessibility is reported using the tool, then that, that is a really great start and will definitely uh, have a positive effect on your accessibility, but it's not a guarantee of accessibility. We talk a lot about technical accessibility, which is what a checker can measure, but functional accessibility is a very different thing. Actually, you know, what is the user experience for somebody who's using an assistive technology or has a custom configuration or something? Um, you know, can they perform the functions that are intended with the website and can they do so easily? Can they find, find their way around and so forth? That, those sorts of things are very difficult, if not impossible, for automated tools to measure. Also, you'll find as, as you get into playing around with checkers that they all are different. Um, results vary from checker to checker. And that doesn't mean that any of them is necessarily right or wrong. It's just different perspectives. So I think that is important to keep in mind. So I'm going to stop my sharing and turn it over to Anna Marie to show us what um, how Sight Improve fits into all this. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Terrell said, I'm going to be talking about Sight Improve, and and and. A little bit further, they have a couple of uh, browser demos that I'd like to show you today. So um, if you're not actually using the Site Improve platform at the moment, um, maybe you're wondering, are these browser extensions a good alternative for you? So let's take a look at that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen now. Okay, so uh, first off, I have a demo page that I created for today. And so I'd like to start by doing a tour of the demo page so that you guys can get it, get a um, good view of what it looks like, all of the different things that are on it that, that we're going to be looking for in the checkers. So um, first off, I have a heading structure here that's listed out of order. We go from accessibility here, a heading two, to heading structure, which is an H5. And then the next one, alternative text for images, is an H3. So we skipped from an H2 to an H5 there. Um, then the next thing on the page here is alternative text for images. So I have a image of strawberries that I placed on the page here, and I did not add my alt text. Um, so this is what that looks like in my markup right now. I just have an image with a source. There is no, no attributes, no alt text. And what that really should look like, because I want people that look at my image to know that I have fresh strawberries, not just people who can see it, but I want everyone to know that. So in this case, note I have alt equals fresh strawberries. Um, sometimes, a d image is just a decoration. For example, I could have used this image of strawberries as a background photo for something else or to have text imposed on it. So in that case, it's not really all that important for folks to know that I have strawberries. So in this case, note I have alt equals quote, quote. That will allow assistive technologies to ignore the image. Next thing on our demo page here is color contrast. So I have two boxes here. Um, what, the first one is presented in good contrast with a black background and white text. And then the, the second one that says poor contrast is presented in a black background with a dark gray um, text. And for your visual users, even that's kind of hard to read, isn't it? So imagine if you had low vision and those colors that are so kind of close together, if you don't see well, just kind of meld together and you don't see the text at all. And then next thing I have here is link text. We can write link text so it's usable for assistive technology users. So instead of this, so notice I have click here to go to the accessible technology website with click here being my link and then learn more about our events and collaborations with learn more being the link. But instead of that, it's a lot better if we do it like this. So visit the accessible technology website with accessible technology being the link or learn more about our events and collaborations with 
actually events and collaborations being the link. And so I, I get this question a lot. Why is this really important? Why do I need to think about this when I'm uh, editing my website? Well, next here I have a photograph to help illustrate why that's important. So assistive technology users have this whole other way of navigating that us visual users don't know about, or I didn't know about until I started learning about accessibility. And that is um, they can navigate the page by various keyboard shortcuts. So one of those keyboard shortcuts is bringing up a list of links on the page. And when I bring up a list of links on this page, I have a little snippet of that here. And you can see here, it says, click here, learn more. And then my second set of links, accessible technology and events and collaborations. So if I'm looking at this list, even since I have it in a visual format now so that I can see it visually, I still don't know what click here and learn more really mean. What's going to happen when I click those? So there's no context for users to know that. But notice in my second set there, accessible technology and events and collaborations, you have a pretty good idea of what you're going to find then when you follow those links. So on to um, quality assurance items, and those items are things that maybe don't necessarily affect the accessibility of a page, but affect the overall quality and usability of the page. Um, and so I'm talking about broken links and misspellings in particular here. So um, the tools, um, at least the web platform, it's, it flags broken links. And so I have this link here, and, and it's rendered on the page. It, um, or in and in my um, so notice it says washington.edu slash accessibility. But the way it appears in my code editor is the Washington is missing the H, so the H is misspelled, thus breaking my link. And then I have a short list here for misspellings, um, some words that are commonly misspelled. Um, so we have acceptable that's with a T-I-B in the middle when it should be T-A-B. We have height, which should actually be height, so there should not be an H on the end. And receive, remember that rule, I after E except after C, so the I, I E should be E-I in receive. So, okay, so here's the demo page. And I'm in the Firefox browser right now, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna activate the Site Improve Accessibility Checker plugin for, brow uh, for um, Firefox. So what I get is this little window that pops up. It's still spinning as it checks the page. And notice how it doesn't even fill the, fill the height of my browser right now. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this down so that I can see the height of my browser so I can get more information. So remember one of the first thing on our demo page here was about headings. So we can see here that it flagged my headings are not structured. And when I click on this, it can give me a little bit more information about why that is an issue. Um, note one thing also, there's an Explorer tab here in the Firefox checker. And that's kind of handy for checking different um, visual impairment so I can apply filters to this page using this so that I can see what that would look like to somebody that has a visual impairment. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the issues now. So that was headings um, and we, we missed some alt text on our image. So here I have image without a text alternative. And then it gives me the occurrence of the issue here, and it will even outline it on the page for me. And I can even see a code example for how to fix this issue. Okay, the next thing was color contrast. So notice here I, I've got, you know, since we're going for the double A, I'm going to look at this contrast minimum. It's telling me that my color contrast is not sufficient. And then it goes right to that box with the poor contrast with the black text and the dark gray poor contrast in text on it.
Um, and then it doesn't really do anything for our link text. It doesn't really do anything for broken links. It doesn't tell me if it thinks I have a misspelling on the page. So let's com contrast, compare and contrast that with the one in Chrome. So now um, you should be seeing my Chrome browser. Is that correct, Terrell? Okay, and here's our demo page. I'm gonna go ahead and activate the Site Improve Accessibility Checker plugin for Chrome. And as that, as that loaded, it kind of um, made my page spin a little bit there, didn't it? And notice how it, it, it docked the information there on the left side of the screen. So it's not obscuring any of my content that I'm looking at on my page. And I don't have to pull it down so that I can see more information. And also, just notice as I'm looking through here, it's giving me a lot more checkpoints than we saw in the Firefox version. And one thing I want to point out, um, so I, I'm looking at this issue here that has 59 occurrences, and I'm like, okay, what has 59 occurrences on my page? Well, it's actually the focus order, and notice how it has this little icon with an I, and that means it needs a manual check. So that doesn't necessarily mean that this is indeed an issue, but it needs a human eye to know whether that is indeed an issue. But in looking at the, the issues that we laid out in the demo page, um, so the heading structure, we're gonna find that here under navigable. And I have section headings here. So it's telling me here, headings are not nested properly. So I'm going to go ahead and click this. And look at there. It highlights right there on my rendered web page in this um, browser where that issue is. Now, if I want to know where that is in the HTML, I can bring up the dev tools to take a look at that. And it tells me to use control shift I when I hover over that to bring up my dev tools. Now, let me just scroll that back into view. And it has this link here, view code snippet in dev tools. So when I click this code, now that they're already open, it's gonna take me right to where that lives in the HTML. So that makes it really easy for you to go back to your web page and figure out where that is in the code. Okay, and then um, alt text for images. So we're gonna find that under text alternatives, under non-text content. And here it, it, here it is, image with no alt attribute. And when I click there, it's now highlighting my image of fresh strawberries on the page. And if I open the dev tools and click that link again, it will show me again in the code where that lives. So the next issue we had then was color contrast. Here it is under distinguishable. So when I click this, it's actually gonna give, tell me that there are five occurrences of this. So when I look at this, I see that there are a lot of um, issues here that are in the template that I don't necessarily have control over. But if I go to the very bottom one, note that it says poor contrast. So when I click that, it takes me to my box that has that black box with that dark gray text again. So it points out where that is on the page. And then one thing different about this plugin that the Firefox doesn't have is it actually tells me about the link text. So if I go back down to navigable, and link purpose in context. So it's kind of interesting. It points out that click here link on the page. It's not pointing out the learn more link, which is very interesting because two days ago it was finding both of them. So it's just a, a, another clue that while these tools can be very helpful in helping us fix our accessibility, they're not always the beat all end all, and it really does need a human to discern whether something is actually an issue, and it's not maybe gonna flag everything every time.
And then as with Firefox, as far as broken links and misspellings, we're kind of out of luck on that. Um, so this platform is not going to give me give me that kind of information. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual site improve platform in the web platform. So what I've done here is I already have this page loaded because I did a single page check on my site improve demo to make things simpler for our demo, it's already completed. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and open this in a new tab. So when this page loads, notice that it gives me an uh, interface. It looks a lot like the Chrome plugin, doesn't it? It loads where I have the all of the information for the checkpoints on the left side of my screen, and I have the web page in view on the right side of my screen. So in looking at those issues on the demo page again, um, heading structure was the first thing we had. And I'm finding that here again under navigable section headings. And when I click on it here, headings not, are not nested properly. Again, it takes me right to this heading structure heading that is out of order. The difference between this and the Chrome plugin, however, is I don't have to bring up my dev tools to see where this is in my HTML code. I can just hit this HTML button and it will take me right there. So that's kind of handy. Um, so the next um, issue was the alt text for images. Um, so under text alternatives, non-text content, um, it's actually not showing me this time. <laughs> so this is an issue we often have with this platform. Um, they are working on a new engine that we are going to be switching to sometime in the near future, but we have not done that yet. But I'm getting a false positive here. No occurrences of this issue detected. So again, it just points out that even the most robust tools aren't always perfect. And it really takes a human to be able to look at what's going on. Um, so color contrast under distinguishable. I get color contrast is insufficient. Oh, let's go back to the page content view here. Um, so it's giving me all of these areas where the contrast is not sufficient again. And notice how it starts to paginate them. So it's finding more things. Actually, I think it's um, picking up on our previous issue here. So we're getting some of those um, um, code or the examples that it was pointing out highlighted, but here's my poor contrast one here. And it's, you know, it goes right to highlighting that. And again, I can see where that lives in the HTML code. So going back to the issues list, um, we also had link text which is gonna again be under navigable, under link purpose and context. And it says link text is too generic in its current context. And when I click there again, it's only finding the click here link for some reason, it should be also flagging the learn more, but it does give me a good start on where to, where to look for things and what things to look for. And I can again see that in the HTML code. So these are the issues that we saw or, or, or not saw in the browser extensions, but there are a couple things that this web platform does that the browser extensions don't even touch. And that is the quality insurance that I talked about earlier. So on my quality assurance tab, it gives me broken links and misspellings. So when I click on broken links, it takes me right to that broken link on my page and it's pointing out where that link is broken. And again, if I wanna see that in the HTML, it's pointing all of that out there for me too. It also does misspellings or what it 
thinks might be misspellings. And so look, it found my misspelled link. So sometimes that can help you fix your broken links too, if you happen to do a typo as I have done here. And again, I can go look at that in the HTML if I want to. But also what I'm seeing are some misspellings in that list that I had here. So as I go into each one of these, I can highlight where those live on the page as well. So it, this is really nice because it gives you a couple extra things to check for to ensure the quality of your website. So let's just take an overview of them all. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a document up here for a site improved comparison. In the first column, I have the issues listed that were on my demo page. I, in the two middle columns, I have browser extensions, Firefox and Chrome. And then the last column is web platform. So the heading structure is reported in Firefox, Chrome, and the web platform as well as alt text for images and color contrast. When we get down to link text, we're looking at Chrome and the web platform if we wanna find those. And then with broken links and misspellings, we don't get any of those in the browser extensions, but we do get them in the web platform. So my comments about them in general would be that the Firefox plugin is not really very robust. The Chrome, uh, plugin, however, is very robust, but the most robust one is the web platform. So in Firefox, it doesn't dock, it, ex it obscures content. The resizing is not saved, by the way. So every time you re refresh that, you have to resize it. Um, oh, I forgot to show you about the filters that were in there. So in each one of these, there are actually filters you can do to, to filter by conformance level. And at UW, we go for AA. Um, you, can, you can do it by um, the expert level um, responsibility. So this can be kind of iffy for us at UW because so many folks wear so many different hats. Um, but Site Improve has attempted to break down each task into where, where it what role it thinks does those tasks. And then this one actually lets me select elements, but I don't have anything selected. So by default, um, it's, it's not filtering down on everything. It's giving me everything it's got. The Chrome version does that as well. But the beautiful thing about the Chrome filters is if I close my browser and I open it back up, it saves whatever I select in here. And then, so going back to the comparison sheet. So again, the Firefox doesn't dock, it obscures content, resizing is not saved, the filters are not saved. Um, it does have a code view um, and Explorer for the, um, visual impairment views, which we don't really see in the other two versions. Um, and as an overall suggestion, I would use the Firefox browser plugin as a complement to other tools. I would not use it as a standalone checker because there's a lot missing from it. The Chrome one is more robust. It docks to the left of the window. It doesn't obscure the content. Um, it auto sizes to the window height. The filters are saved, the code view, via the browser tools as well, and it gives you more checkpoints. The most robust, the web platform, we have web pages in the platform. It doesn't obscure the content. It auto sizes to the window size. The settings and filters are saved. You again have a code view. It's a little more um, easier to use the code view because you get a direct link to it. And it, and it has most checkpoints. So that's kind of where we're at on comparing and contrasting the three of those. So at this point, I know Terrell has some great tools to show you. Thanks, Anna Marie. There are, there are a few uh, questions in chat that I think have all been addressed. Oh, okay. Um, so, we're, so we're good there. Um, a couple of them, or one, one was about uh, how to 
how to get access. And, and that was a person from UW Medicine. And so they, they do have a separate license. Um, but uh, for the central license, we actually have a fixed number of pages, and but we are always trying to make room for people that are interested. Um, and, and I shared the URL where people can go to the site and proof page and there's information there about how to request access. So uh, meanwhile, if you don't have access to Site and Brew, there are lots of tools uh, that are available for free still. And that's what I want to show. Um, just uh, give you a quick, quick look at a few of those. And before I show tools themselves, I wanted to show once again the tools and resources page, uh, which is again at uw.edu slash accessibility slash tools. We have uh, lots of information here, including tutorials. We can learn about what accessibility links directly to the guidelines and standards. And then we've got links and in some cases, some annotations about various checkers and browser extensions, um, code validators, color checkers, and, and assistive technologies, and much more. So check this out. It is the definitive resource um, from us on tools that we um, you know, we feel are, are useful and should be a part of everybody's arsenal. And once again, you know, try, try many different tools because they all give you a different perspective on your website. So the site that I wanted to look at actually in demonstrating these tools is one that we developed for the purposes of um, accessibility demos. It's called Accessible University. I'm actually looking at a local version um, currently. But if you just Google Accessible University Demo Site, then you should land on this. Um, it, uh, it is <clears throat> maintained by uh, us on a couple of grants. Um, but the heart of it is that we have an inaccessible university website, web page, home page, and we have an accessible version of the same page. So I've got both of those pulled up here. There's the inaccessible version. Here is the accessible version, which basically looks the same and has all the same content, but it's coded in a way that it is accessible. So in some of our other presentations, we actually go through all the issues that are, are here and demonstrate uh, web accessibility using this tool. Um, the third, you can do this yourself, actually, the third um, page in this set of three, um, page number two, is a list of accessibility issues. So if you go to that, you actually see what all the problems are and explanations of those problems and, um, and information about how to fix them. So the solutions are there too. And there are 18 known problems on this page. So since we know that there are 18 problems and we know what those problems are, then that really comes in handy when we use um, accessibility checkers because we can kind of compare you know, what we know with what the, the checkers are communicating to us. So the first one I want to show is WAVE, which is from WebAIM. That is uh, a group out of Utah State University. Really uh, have great resources related to web accessibility, um, both just things that you can learn from as well as tools. And we've got uh, the, web, the WAVE plugin. Um, like Site Improve, they have a Firefox plugin and a Chrome plugin. And the Chrome plugin ha does have some more features than the Firefox plugin. Um, but if we click on the, on the uh, Wave uh, icon, then it gives us an overview this, in the summary side of things. It says there are 21 errors. Um, so actually, three more errors than we know about. There also are four contrast errors, and then it gives you some additional information, some alerts, which would be things you need to review manually. Um, and then also structural elements and features um, and ARIA if there is any. So, um, so this, and then there's an icon. There are icons scattered throughout the page that you can click on to explore and, you know, and learn within the context of your web page what all the issues are. Um, this does get a little bit overwhelming, particularly if you have a lot of errors. And so if you go to the details tab, which I can do by clicking on the details tab or by clicking view details, then you can actually turn things off. So if I don't want to see contrast errors right now, and I don't want to see alerts or features or structural elements, I just want to focus on those errors, that cleans it up a little bit. 
and then you can you can focus in even further. Um, if I I don't want to see all these missing form labels right now, I just want to focus on missing alt text. So so I click on the first one of these, and it it highlights the image that is missing alt text. So I know then okay that accessible university banner at the top is missing alt text. So I need to fix that. Um, so and so forth. You can just go through uh, with each of these issues. You can you can navigate through the sidebar, or if we do actually show the label label missing labels down here, you can click on any icon and it gives you more information as well. Um, and you can actually you can go to a reference page where they describe the issue in more detail. You can click on code to see the actual HTML that is causing this problem. So lots of different ways to, to view the issue. And you'll find that every tool pretty much has these same features. You can view the code. You can highlight the problematic element on the page. And you are provided with some reference material to learn more about this issue. And that in particular is kind of what makes and breaks the different tools, I think, is how well do they explain things? So just so do follow up on that and you know, try to learn about the issues that it is communicating to you. And you probably will find that you like how some tools describe things and don't like how other tools describe things. One particular issue I want to point out uh, with Wave is the contrast checker. Um, it throws up an icon for every contrast failure. And it turns out it's the menus, the all four of those menu items fail look at contrast requirements. Um, the nice thing about this is you can change the color. So this is the foreground here that's gray and then that's on kind of a cream colored um, background. If we decide we wanna fix this by making the text darker, then we can just, go down a little bit, gradually watch the pass fail ratings until we attain a pass rating for level 2A. This is what we're trying to meet, level 2A, normal size text. And we find that um, 575E75, that, that hex code, will meet our needs. That passes, and it's within the same color family as the original. So then we just plug that value into our style sheet and we fix the problem. So that is super helpful you know, to have not just reporting errors, but actually giving us a tool um, that enables us to fix um, the errors. So that's all uh, I wanna show with Wave at the moment. Um, so, um, and the next, next few tools I wanna show on the, the accessible site, because <clears throat> No, they won't show up with anything on the not accessible site. And the first of those is accessibility bookmarklets. So I have up here um, across the top of my browser, a few bookmarklets that I've saved. Um, these all have the separate bookmarklets, but they provide particular functionality related to accessibility. So uh, one of those is headings. So if we wanted to see the heading structure of this page, what I believe it should be visually, um, so that it forms an outline of the page and doesn't skip levels is accessible university that banner you know maybe that's a, a heading one and then you get several others that seem to be peers of one another uh, welcome um, bienvenido in spanish um, can you spot the barriers au enrollment trends those all seem to be h2s so if i click on headings then it outlines the headings. And I see that indeed this page does correspond with what my visual expectations are. The H2s are H2s. In fact, there's another one over here for the apply now form. And there's an H3 inside that that allows you to jump directly to the security question. Um, so that's just a quick way to see the headings. You can do the same thing with ARIA landmarks. Um, it identifies them, it draws a box around them. Super helpful. It also has a means of checking images for alt text and checking accessibility forms and uh, lists. So another tool that can do all the same things but does a little differently is the web developer toolbar. This I find to be super helpful because it just has so many things. Um, and really it's, it's designed as the name implies 
for web development, you know, any anything you want to do to explore your website or anybody else's website, you've got features here to allow you to do that. And accessibility just happens to be integrated into it. So if I, for example, go to outline, I can outline the headings and it gives me kind of a similar uh, interface to what we saw with the bookmark books, but, but a little bit different. And I actually find that this is a little more robust so it can find headings on dynamic pages where the bookmarklets sometimes don't find them. And also if you scroll, uh, the CSS that it added to the page stays in place. Whereas with the bookmarklets, the CSS tends to get a little wonky um, if you scroll. So, um, oops, wrong icon. Um, Another thing you can do is look for alt text on images, different ways to do that. But the one I like to use is display alt attributes. And then it, um, it actually shows the alt text next to any of the, the images that are here. So you've got accessible university for the banner, you've got previous slide, next slide for these uh, buttons and uh, so forth. Um, the other tools I wanna show are in the dev tools that come with the browser, Firefox has um, these two, but different. Um, and just beat the font up a little bit there, so you can see. Oops, that might be a little too much because I can't see my menu options. Um, so the two, the two things I wanna show that are accessibility related are Lighthouse. So this is built into Chrome, you already have it. And when you select that, Lighthouse will generate a report based on a lot of different things. Performance, progressive web app, best practices, accessibility, SEO. You can do desktop versus mobile. Uh, so if we just look at accessibility, we click generate a report. It uh, warms up, analyzes the page. And it then gave us perfect score of 100. That's because I'm on the accessible side of things. If I go over to the not accessible and go to Dev Tools and run Lighthouse Accessibility Reports, then it only has a score of 52, which actually, since this is intentionally you know, the worst, the least accessible that we could make it. <laughs> But it arguably should be a lower score than that. 52 is kind of generous, I think. Um, but it, um, it then provides um, information about um, the things that it observed. There are issues related to navigation. There are issues related to contrast. It's got a kind of a high level. Um, the HTML element does not have a lang attribute to identify what language this page is in. Um, if we look at, let's say the contrast issues, just open that up, expand that, and it shows us an image of the failing elements, and that's handy. And if we click on that, it zooms in a little bit on it. And it also gives us the failing element, um, which I thought we could click on that to go to the element, but I'm not seeing that at the moment. Um, but anyway, this is, um, you know, it does have some nice visual features and, and it's just a different sort of interface for reporting, you know, the same sorts of issues that you might get elsewhere. But once again, likely it will be communicating some different issues as well. Uh, one final tool I want to show is Axe Dev Tools. Um, this is available as a free plugin, but they also have a commercial version and they're, uh, they, they try to get you to upgrade uh, pretty aggressively. So that gets a little bit annoying, but it's a good tool. And the Axe engine is widely used as an API to drive a lot of accessibility tools. Um, they, they, it is an open source um, accessibility checking engine and really does uh, probably as good as anybody at um, you know, sort of advancing and innovating um, the state of accessibility checkers. So, so it found that there were 58 issues. Um, and, you know, I can go through and I can find the different issues. I can take their guided tour of the various issues. And, um, and it kind of walks me through all of them. Um, 
lots of lots of the same features you can look at code you can look at the object on the web page it gives you know information explanation about the various issues um and it's kind of neat that you can also here in the dev tools console you can it'll take you right to the source code you can make a change right there in the source code and then this value will hopefully decrease if you did it correctly then you'll see that number go down. So you can right there in the dev console, um, make changes and watch your score get better. And then of course, you've got to go apply those changes to the live site, but, um, but it, it's nice that it gives you that live feedback. So uh, I'm gonna stop now. We only have a couple minutes left, but I want to um, respond to any questions that came in and chat. Are there, you been following those, Anna Marie? Yes. Um, we don't have any questions. Everything that's been asked has been answered up to here. Okay. So let me just ask then, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Well, let me... Let me go to, I saw a, um, somebody has a Kraken, is it Sarah? Has a Kraken logo as a background. I was actually asked today whether the Kraken website is accessible. And so we can use this opportunity for me to do a live check. And I'm just gonna use the wave tool. Let's wait for a moment. And the Kraken website unfortunately has 147 errors. So then we could go through the details and we could find out what those are. The 25 images missing alt text, 111, this is the biggie, uh, linked images missing alt text. So they really you know, have got a, got a lot of work to do related to the alt text. And, and I, don't, I don't wanna blame the Kraken specifically because I, you know, I wanna be a Kraken fan. <laughs> and I do think this is NHL all the team websites kind of look the same. They're all using the same template. And so um, this really is probably an NHL issue that they need to crack down on uh, the, the lack of accessibility across the board on their websites. Okay, well, um, that's all the time we have today. This, uh, this session is gonna be up in the archives. So I encourage everybody to send others towards this presentation if you think it's going to be useful for others. Or once again, go to our accessibility uh, slash events page to find out other opportunities to learn more about um, IT accessibility and all of its flavors. Thanks, everyone.